Well, as we're finishing up our our pool desserts, and uh, uh, assuming coffee and tea will be poured if required, um, I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce Brooke Knoll to everybody here. Um, I met Brooke, I think about a week after she landed in Kansas City from Minneapolis to start her job at Classical KC, probably at some fundraising reception or other. Um, and um, as a, an aside, I do want to say, so um, as Jacob mentioned, the, the goodie bags, which are full of Classical KC and KCUR swag, are yours to take home, as are the mugs and flowers to take home. Uh, we have these very fun Classical KC mugs from a couple of years ago, from the fundraisers a couple of years ago. This is my personal fave in the designs, because some of the designs have gotten a little weird, basically, I have to say. Um, but in the goodie bags are all kinds of things. There's pencils and fridge magnets and clippies that are magnetized that are wonderful. And my personal fave, lip balm with a classical KC logo on it. So um, all of those things are you can take home with you. And please do, because I do not want to have to take them home myself, since I'm the one who pull together all the decor. Um, I would also like to point out that Classical KC is going to be doing their fall fundraiser on Giving Tuesday, this artificial holiday after Thanksgiving, um, in which everybody's supposed to do donations. Um, and so it's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. I am doing a match for new members on Giving Tuesday. I will match up to $2,000 for new members at Classical KC. So you guys have to call in, because they really, really want my money. And we were we failed to, to, to make the match in the summer, so um, you know now's the time to do it. Um, I've been very involved in uh, um, Classical KC as it's evolved in the last three years, and I'm very proud of this station, and very pleased to be able to introduce Brooke to you. Um, Brooke and I had coffee soon after our first meeting, um, and here I was, a person of some years, in other words, old enough to be Brooke's grandmother, uh, overwhelmed with admiration for this kid who dropped into the Kansas City public radio scene after juggling multiple jobs at Minnesota Public Radio while earning three undergraduate degrees. If you're a regular listener to Classical KC, 91.9, all right, or HD2, KCUR HD2, you've heard Brooke's mellifluous and engaging voice frequently in both interviews and announcements. She charged into the programming and social media sites with energy and determination with shows such as Kansas City Local Feature, in which Brooke interviews people involved in upcoming performances in the KC region. Brooke also edits the monthly newsletter, Take Note, which anyone can subscribe to. But all of us who are supporters of Classical KC would ask you to make a donation if you're reading our content. Something that Brooke didn't anticipate, however, also happened. Her two degrees focusing on the business of the arts brought her to Kansas City, but her degree in harp performance and her interest in performing interesting music is making her a well-known and admired presence in the recital and pop-up performance scene, often with flautist Mary Jamerson. I attended one of their recitals recently, and it was amazing and wonderful. Uh, although, BB might not like it because it, it had a lot of Philip Glass in it. <laughs> and it was glorious. Um, Brooke's talent as a harpist, a fiendishly difficult instrument to become professional uh, and, and well-versed in, are as exceptional as her talents as a public radio personality. I know something about the fierceness of harpists. I taught ballet to a harpist back in my previous university, um, uh, to a harpist and composer named Han Lash, 
who is now a professor at the IU School of Music and was one of the most intense and driven students I have ever had the pleasure to teach. I think the devotion to the heart requires that level of ferocity of purpose, and Brooke certainly has that. Brooke also has other talents. She's delightful to hang out with, she has a lot of very interesting things to say, and she has a worldview that goes well beyond her, shall we say, modest number of years. So without further ado, I present Brooke Knoll, who will be talking to us this evening on Subverting the Strings, the Inextricable Link Between Harp and Gender. generous introduction um, and thank you for asking me to be here to speak um, I first of all want to clarify I have one degree with three majors I'm not that impressive um, but my uh, undergraduate uh, degrees degree is in business um, so I have a degree in entrepreneurial management and public nonprofit management as well as a major in heart performance so Ending up in public radio was kind of a marriage of my interests, and um, the presentation that I'm going through today is an expansion of my senior thesis in college. Um, existing in a hyper-feminine space as a harpist in the music world was in direct contrast to what I was learning in my business classes, which is a very hyper-masculine space. So I was really drawn to uh, exploring why gender is associated with these two areas, and how historically gender and harp have been intertwined since the beginning. I'm going to quickly set up my harp so that it's ready. I'm gonna have some moments where I play some examples of things. So if you give me one second, I'm gonna get my electric harp named Duke Silver set up. <laughs> specialist and on-air host for Classical KC, which is Kansas City's only 24-7 classical music station. You can find us at 91.9 FM or at classicalkc.org. And I am a professional performing and teaching harpist. I teach lessons and I perform everywhere in Kansas City from um, private parties to uh, classical performances. And I played an avant-garde show in a sewer drain. So you can find me most places in Kansas City playing music uh, from the avant-garde to the classical. So in, in this presentation, uh, which first of all, reacquainted me with JSTOR. I revived a lot of my primary sources, which was really fun. Um, I'm gonna go through the origins of the harp within the world, um, its historical significance, the development of the modern harp, which we see today, um, and then, of course, the role of gender in Western classical harp playing and composition. I wanna clarify that this is purely through the Western classical lens. Harp exists all throughout the world, and there are many different avenues in which harpists explore genre, etc. So first of all, what comes to mind when you think of the harp? Take a moment to think about it. Any particular images, sounds, sights? The harp that I have here on the screen is a concert grand pedal harp. That's primarily what you see in orchestras. I have one of a similar model, it is not gold. Um, and that is, that is typically what you see when you think of a harp. It's very large, ornate. Um, there's other types of harps that exist in modern music. On the far left, you'll see a more Celtic harp, and that features levers, which I will get into. Um, that middle harp is a Paraguayan harp used a lot in uh, Central American music. Um, and then of course on the right, a concert grand pedal harp, which is more in the classical world. So harp, had a wonderful simultaneous invention across the world. Um, in Egypt, uh, that's the one on the top left. 
Um, the Burmese harp is on the right, and then on the bottom you'll see an example of an Irish slash Welsh harp. Um, it developed first of all in Africa and Asia before making its way to Europe, um, and there were a lot of purposes for harp. In modern usage, um, there is folk harp, there's the South American harp, which I mentioned earlier, there's a triple harp, which has three sets of strings. Um, that's not quite as common. Um, and then the pedal harp as well. And there I am, playing with a KC war event, actually. So what was the role of harp in society, and how did gender play into that? So starting in um, ancient Egypt, circa 2500 BC, um, there are a lot of depictions of harpists in religious contexts communicating with the gods, like Horus in that depiction. And as you notice, the harpist in that picture is bald and wearing a garment, which signifies that they are a wise man or someone who is um, of a certain bureaucratic and literate level that they are seen and deemed appropriate to commune with the gods through music. Um, so in a religious context, uh, those that were literate typically were men. Um, women at the time did also play harp, but um, primarily in secular spaces. And while in religious context, uh, harp music was learned through written music and pictures, um, in secular and entertainment spaces, it was more through oral tradition. Uh, so that's how women primarily learned the harp during that time. And it's fascinating, uh, in one of the sources I looked at, um, female musicians were typically on retainer for elite households for like private entertainment, um, but those that were hired for secular entertainment for those not in the elite class were kind of viewed on the same level um, as prostitutes. So it's very interesting to see how this instrument was used in different spaces and through different genders. Along with religious practices in Europe, once the harp made its, apologies, in Egypt, once it made its way to Europe, um, it was used in religious depictions like King David playing the harp, um, and it was primarily used as an accompaniment to the human voice to commune with God. Um, it was in possession of religious leaders and clergy members who were literate and able to read music. Um, if you think about you know, the Catholic tradition of, you know, that's how things were communicated was through song. Um, I also found it interesting in a text that I read that the concept of practicing an instrument, learning songs, hymns, that re repetition um, was considered a sort of deference to God as well, that you were taking the time to continue to learn something in practice um, was a form of religion, not as well. Um, but when music became performance, it ceased to be prayer. So during this time, during the Middle Ages, um, harp played primarily by men um, was used in a prayer context and not for performance. But when we go to performance and storytelling, we get to the image of classical Greek and Rome. There are a lot of uh, Greek myths that feature the harp, but actually the lyre, which there's a lot of misconceptions between a harp and a lyre. Um, when you look at a harp, the strings are actually perpendicular to the soundboard. So you have the soundboard here and the strings come out this way. While on a lyre, the strings are parallel to the soundboard, much more like a guitar. So during this period, the lyre and the harp were kind of interchangeable, um, especially in like translated texts. A lot of times people will translate it to harp instead of lyre, which is actually what the instrument was. Um, but you know, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, going to the underworld, Orpheus was um, playing music to hopefully bring back his love from the underworld. Uh, and then in the story of Achilles and Patrocles, the lyre is a symbol of innocence and naivete. In Ireland, it's obviously now a very recognized national symbol of Ireland is the harp. You see it on Guinness beers. You see it all over Ireland. Um, and it has long been an accompaniment for song in Gaelic culture. 
Um, in the, from the 12th to the 17th century, uh, it was primarily oral tradition of learning the songs and passing them along through bards. Uh, but Turlo O'Carolan, who is pictured there, uh, was probably the most famous or the last of the Irish bards. Um, a lot of his music is still played today by harpists of classical and Celtic backgrounds. Um, uh, and when Turlo Carillon started, you know, transcribing these pieces of music, it was actually after a harp had gone out of style in Ireland after being repressed um, by the English. So it's interesting to see harp as a symbol of nationalism in Ireland, uh, and also as something primarily played by musicians providing entertainment. So all of the harps that we've seen up until this point are primarily simple instruments. They vary from six to 30 strings, and the strings, what they are tuned to, those are the notes that you're playing. There are different mechanics that have now expanded the range of a harp. So if you look at my harp behind me, you see these levers, and when I change a lever, it changes the pitch of a note by a half step. So when I do the lever, it shortens the string. So I'll show you an example. So those were introduced before we had the introduction of the single action pedal harp. Um, one writer uh, noted that, that I read, uh, the single action pedal harp, once it was invented, changed the harp from a primitive instrument to a, quote, instrument that can be taken seriously for the first time. Uh, so it was invented around 1700 in Germany, and this is actually from the Metz collection. Um, and if you look down at the bottom, you can't really see in this picture, but there are seven pedals there. There are seven notes in a diatonic scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And so each of those pedals corresponds to a note in that scale. And when you depress one of those pedals, every single string of that note changes pitch. So, for example, if I wanted to change multiple strings from C natural to C sharp, I would just have to depress the C pedal once, and all of those strings would change. How that mechanism worked is that pedal would affect cables that go up through the column, and then there's a hook that would then um, change the length of the string affecting pitch. So this is when classical composers started paying attention to the harp because it had an expanded range. It was viewed more on par with like a harpsichord or a piano. So Mozart, Gluck, Beethoven, and uh, Louis Schwor actually started composing for harp at this time. Um, this is when the harp kind of transitioned from a more folk instrument into a classical performance instrument. Still at this time, primarily, men were playing the harp until it became a salon instrument. Um, so now that its status in society as an instrument had been elevated, it was used as background music during meetings of the individuals, great minds, thinking salon parlors, um, and kind of moving forward a little bit to romanticism, uh, the harp was able to elicit the emotions that were in vogue at the time, really leading into the emotional impact of uh, things. Um, Jane Austen wrote about harps in drawing rooms, and Charles Dickens uh, in uh, David Copperfield wrote of a harpist's power to uh, emphasize the emotional component of that instrument and drawing emotions out of others. Along with being used in salons, played by both women and men, it was used as a tool of evaluation um, as women were judged for uh, Marriage, marriage eligibility. So <laughs> now that it was a more elite instrument, um, families wanted their daughters to learn harp so it could improve their chances for a higher status. Um, young women were encouraged to learn harp alongside piano and harpsichord. Um, and in an article from the 1800s, there's a quote that says, it is a fact that an agreeable proficiency on the harp can be attained in a comparatively short time. So it was fit for women to learn because it, it didn't require a lot of work to reach a proficiency that was deemed impressive. And again, this is all the single action pedal harp. And the harps that we see today are actually double action pedal harps, which is what helps it enter into chamber and orchestral repertoire. 
So the double action pedal harp uh, is taking the concept of a single action pedal harp and making it even better. So as you see on that picture, there are those seven pedals and there are two notches now. So the harp is tuned to C flat and then when you put the pedal into the center notch, it'll, it'll be in the key of C natural. And then if you depress all the pedals to the bottom, it'll be in C sharp. So this drastically increased the range of the harp, and this is when uh, composers really started paying attention to it. Um, a great example is Hector Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. A uh, beautiful piece of music. Fun fact, harp is only on the second of the five movements, and there's two harps. Um, it is not an easy piece to play. Hector immediately was like, we're gonna challenge these harpists and push them to the limit. Um, but it's really interesting seeing how composers started running with this instrument now that it was deemed a part of the orchestra. Um, along with the invention of the double action pedal harp, the mechanisms of switching pedals was deemed as masculine, so men felt comfortable and confident playing the harp in orchestral settings, and women weren't necessarily invited to play in orchestral settings. Um, but during the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, women were often second harpists or substitutes for men harpists in orchestras. Um, yes. So continuing with orchestral usage, um, more composers, opera composers, really started writing for harp. Um, Puccini, Monteverdi, Gluck. In orchestral settings, um, it's really uh, prominent in romantic music as well as impressionist music. Um, and at first, when composers started writing for the harp in an orchestral setting, they really relied on its color effects. So it doesn't really have a lot of melodic purpose. It carries a lot of um, ornamentation. So for example, arpeggios, harmonics, and glissandi, which sound like this. But a few factors contributed to the rise of women taking posts in major orchestras, especially in North America. Um, there are a few key harp pedagogues in uh, the early 20th century, Marcel Rajne and Carlos Salcedo being two of them, who were really determined to legitimize the instrument in the eye of the public and in the eye of orchestras. So Carlos Salcedo especially was a highly respected authority on the instrument and he really worked to prove the reputation of the harp and shape the public's perception of it. So as the popularity of the harp grew, so did harp studios. He really encouraged um, teaching more students, making them feel comfortable. A lot of female students decided to take up the harp as it became more common. He established the main harp colony, which still exists to this day. It's a yearly festival where a bunch of harpists go out to Maine and learn the Salzano method, which is a very particular technique. Um, but there are names now attached to specific techniques within the harp world. So you have Grajne technique, you have Salzano technique, and um, that kind of helped build the prestige of the instrument. Um, and to this day, people are proud of their harp lineage. I am personally a harp granddaughter of Marcel Grajene. Um, My harp professor studied with him when he was the professor at, at the Juilliard School. So um, it's kind of adding that lineage that other instruments um, have always had. Um, so this legitimization of female harp players and orchestras in America was not the same in Europe. Um, the Vienna Formula Philharmonic is a great example. They did not admit their first female musician until 1997, uh, the harpist Anna Lovkiss. So along with uh, being in orchestras, the writing of the time reflected stereotypes of the harp being a feminine instrument. 
For example, in Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, there's a lot of arpeggios, Debussy's La Mer, a lot of Wagner operas feature kind of more of those ornamentation effects that a lot of people would view as feminine. So how are these stereotypes reinforced? How do we get to today where we primarily think of harp as a feminine instrument? So in popular culture, there's, going back to the question I asked earlier, there's, there's a couple of images that might have come to your mind, right? A angel with long blonde hair playing the harp. Maybe it's the seductive nature of the Aristocats cat playing the harp. And then I threw in, I thought it was really interesting, Harpo Marx. I watched a lot of the Marx Brothers as a child. I have them on DVD. And um, that is interesting because, yes, it is a male harpist, but it was used in a comedic context. So it wasn't taken as a necessarily serious instrument. So those are just some of the ways that harp has manifested in popular culture throughout the 20th and 21st century. So the concept of femininity goes beyond gender. Um, there's a lot of gay male harpists who have been affected by the stereotypes associated with the harp. Um, Emmanuel Cezanne, who's pictured there, was the harpist for the Metropolitan Opera and is now the harpist for the LA Phil, very accomplished. And there are a lot of studies, newer studies, that kind of dive into how these gender perceptions cross over based on if you are a man playing the harp now, as it is classified to be a feminine instrument. And psychologically, it's ingrained in us. There are multiple studies from the 70s up until the early 2000s that have asked music educated and non-music educated college students to elementary students about how they um, perceive instruments' genders based on how they sound. And harp consistently ranks number one, followed by flute and piccolo. So it is just ingrained in us through our, our culturalization and what we see and what we hear that the harp is a hyperfeminine instrument. So, today, obviously, there are many people who play harp of many gender identities, sexual identities, and um, they don't necessarily play in a purely classical setting. So, how are these conventions being flipped on their head? Well, first of all, through composition. Uh, there are a lot of composers, especially in the mid-20th century, who really decided to experiment with how the harp could sound. Uh, Paul Hindemith with his new objectivity, that's more in the earlier 20th century. Um, but Luciano Berrio has one of my favorite quotes about composing for harp. Um, he wrote a series of sequenzas for different instruments, and on the one for harp he wrote, in my sequenzas, I have tried to develop a musical commentary between the virtuoso and their instrument, and I have often explored specific technical aspects in depth, challenging the conventional notion of the instrument. French Impressionism has left us with a rather limited vision of the harp, as if its most characteristic feature were that it could only be played by half-naked girls with long blonde hair who confined themselves to drawing seductive glissandi from it. But the harp has another harder, louder, and aggressive side to it. So in these pieces that are being composed by these composers from the mid early 20th century to today, there's a lot of techniques that affect how a harp can sound that can make it seem not as, not perceived as feminine. So I'm gonna give you examples of some of these techniques. I'm actually learning the Vario Sequenza for a concert next year and it's very difficult, but very cool. Um, and some of the effects used are, you can use your nails on the string where um, you kind of gives a harsher sound. Um, I don't have my pedal harp here, but pedal slides where when you depress a pedal only halfway, you get a really big zinging sound that's a little bit more aggressive. You can also slap the strings. So I'm just gonna give you examples of some of those, um, as well as just a piece of music that has a little bit more um, pizzazz to it than what you would think from harp. Here I am changing keys. It'd be so much faster if I had a pedal harp. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it sounds like when you have nails on the screen. And then one of my favorite techniques is where you just play a string 
so hard it hits other strings. <laughs> that kind of just has a little bit more of a fun flavor to it is a piece by Carlos Salzedo. It's from his suite of eight dances and it's called Second Year. is one of my favorite composers for the harp because he taught it, he was a harpist himself, um, and he has a lot of pieces that implement um, a lot of nails on the strings, a lot of really weird glissandies and weird keys, um, tonality playing atonal rather than in a very beautiful key affects how it's perceived, and kind of creates this more harsh character to the harp. Uh, the harp is pictured here in this um, image is Melissa Ockton. Uh, she's an LA-based composer and harpist. She does a lot of new music work. She's played with Bang on Can. And as you see in that image, she adds multimedia to the harp. So there are these knit creatures that she has on the harp. And um, this is a fascinating uh, project uh, based on a Greek myth that um, it's just really cool and fascinating and funky, and that's what I really enjoy about it. It's kind of taking the harp and just playing it in a very unexpected way. So representation of the harp uh, in musical spaces also affects how it is perceived. So after having a lot of female harpists rising to um, prominence in the 20th century, now there are a lot of male harpists taking major posts like Emmanuel Cezanne. Uh, primarily they are still in Europe, but then you know he's here in America, which is fantastic. He's a fantastic harpist. Um, also, just not equating femininity with weakness or inferiority when talking about the harp. Femininity can be strong. It can be um, beautiful in a way that's empowering. So kind of flipping the narrative of what it means to be a feminine harpist in spaces when teaching uh, students, when having master classes, really just empowers harpists of all genders and identities to feel confident with their instrument. Also having female harpists in positions of power, uh, that's Nancy Allen who is pictured there. She is the harpist for the New York Philharmonic and has been on the faculty of the Juilliard School for decades. So she's just one great example of a harpist that is really well regarded within the overall harp community and the music community as a whole. So there's a lot of harpists that are also breaking the mold of what it means to be a harpist beyond just in the classical space. So there's jazz harp, there's avant-garde harp, there's rock harp. Um, in the upper right, there's Brandi Younger. She's a wonderful jazz harpist based out of New York. She draws a lot of inspiration from Dorothy Ashby, who was a harpist based out of Detroit in the 1950s. Um, highly recommend looking into Dorothy Ashby's um, catalog. She does a lot of covers of jazz standards as well as original compositions, and it's just beautiful. And Brandy takes that inspiration um, and collaborates with a lot of contemporary jazz musicians as well. In the realm of avant-garde harp, in the lower right corner is Zena Parkins, who is a harpist who does a lot of experimental music, more atonal, free jazz. Um, she uses a lot of um, Lyon Healy, who makes my harp, was influenced by that. So there's a lot of innovators in the harp space that are kind of taking the image of what a harp should sound like and should look like and kind of flipping it on its head. And then myself as a harpist, kind of tying it all back together. Um, I've always had this internal struggle of uh, being an artist versus being a business person, or, or um, it seems as though being an artist or a musician is not serious, which is just a ridiculous thought to have. Um, and being raised as a classical harpist for the longest time after I finished college, I was like, oh man, 
I never want to be an orchestral harpist. This is not who I am. This is not what I enjoy. And when I started to branch out and explore what it means to be a harpist in other realms, I really started to blossom with how I enjoy my instrument, how I play it in different spaces. On the far left, I'm playing with Calvin Arsenia, who's another Kansas City-based harpist. Um, we did a duet as part of Terra Luna. We have a Christmas concert coming up in December, TBD announced, but um, it is going to be excellent. I still do play um, classical harp music like in the middle. That was at a friend's wedding in June. Um, and kind of revisiting these old classics that I had a lot of tension within me about whether or not this is something I really want to pursue. And then on the right, um, that is at a album release party for a friend where I was playing um, pieces that they arranged for a pop album they were releasing. So as a contemporary harpist uh, of you know, who is a cis, white, female. Um, there are so many ways that I can explore harp as uh, an expression of myself and a reflection of the instrument. So, thank you so much for listening uh, to my talk. I do have a list of extensive sources that I should have put on a slide, but if you are interested in learning more, I'd be happy to share any of my resources with you. Um, and if you ever want to learn anything more about harp or just talk to a harpist, hear a harpist, um, you can find my information at blkharp.com. That is my website. I also have cards. Um, but I'm always happy to talk about harp. So thank you. the size of the harp that you, your electric harp that you try, and then I look at the size of the pedal harp. I visualize that the pedal harp has a much longer strings on it, Yes. and I assume that that is the bass area. Yes, so the question was uh, about the size of the pedal harp and how the strings are longer. Um, so yes, a pedal harp, a concert grand pedal harp has 47 strings. And uh, the ones at the end, uh, it goes down to a low D. So I think that's like the D on a piano. Um, and then it goes up to a high G. Um, and it's, it, so this obviously does not have a soundboard because it is electric, but um, concert grand pedal harps do have a very wide soundboard as well, which helps project the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the 18th and 19th century, when young women were learning this to get married, was the harp cost significantly different from a piano? That's a really great question that I would not be able to answer confidently in this moment. Um, but for families that I'm assuming uh, would be able to afford like a harp or a harpsichord, it probably would be of a similar cost. Um, that is something to investigate further, though. I have a question about palaces. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, like guitarists or any other person playing the stringed instrument, but the harp strings are much sharper, aren't they? They're tighter wound than guitar strings. So, how do you manage when you're in the process of learning how to play? manage the, the physical issues that derive from practicing? Yeah, so the question is about calluses and um, how do harpists manage the physical um, needs of playing the instrument. So harps have three different string types. The bass strings are steel wound copper, the middle strings are gut, um, and then the top strings are typically so you have three different um, textures of strings. Unlike a acoustic guitar, which has all steel strings, a harpist is not typically playing the bass strings as often as they are the gut strings in the middle. Um, with that being said, harpists do get calluses. I have some right now, especially after preparing for that recital that was an hour long of prepared music. Um, but harpists, 
do not want to have the same amount of calluses as you would as a guitarist. So when you're a guitarist, having calluses is actually kind of great because it gives you a little bit more grip. You don't really feel the pain of playing those strings. Um, but if a harpist gets too many calluses, it can affect the sound on those gut strings. So um, if I over practice and I get a callus that is too large or too rough, I have to file it down. Um, <laughs> conversely, if I'm practicing in a way that is not sustainable, it's really easy to get blisters. And that's kind of the number one enemy of a harpist is getting a blister before you get to the callus stage. So yeah, and physically the harp, uh, a concert grand pedal harp weighs about 80 pounds. Um, I have wheels to haul it around, but I also um, know that one side of my back is significantly stronger than the other. Uh, I've gotten massages before where they're like, wow, why is one side of your back really buff and the other one not? Because you're resting the harp on one shoulder consistently. So mm -hmm. the physical requirements of playing are very interesting. And that's not even getting into technique because I won't go down that road, but Salzedo's technique is, there people like worship his technique and they don't want to deviate from it. They're like, you need to have your thumb in this position. You need to have you know this specific placement which for certain anatomy is just not conducive to effective playing. Um, while other techniques, they're, they all kind of come out of the French school, but like Rajane is a little bit more relaxed, and I kind of do a combination of both because it just works best for my hands. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I was on a, a plane recently and uh, had three seats uh, I shared with a, a, I think it was a bass or a double bass, you know, I had one of the seats and then the, uh, you know, the artist was in the, in the second seat. How do you, I mean, is it sort of rent a harp? Do you, how do you do that if you're going to another city? Do you share these things or how does that work? That's a great question. So the question is about how do you travel with a harp? Um, so if you're traveling locally, I have a Subaru Outback and I put it in the back of my car um, and I have a soft case that goes on it. So that's how I protect the harp as I move it. Um, if you're traveling uh, farther distances, the harp world is so small and interconnected. It is easy to reach out to harpists in an area or a local chapter of the American Harp Society and be like, hey, I'm playing an event. I would love to either rent or borrow a harp. Um, and if you're traveling internationally, you can rent a harp. Or in high school, I went on a European tour with um, the orchestra I was playing with, and we brought a harp with us. And it was a concert grand pedal harp, and we put it in a coffin case uh, because it looks like a coffin. And there's a lot of padding on the inside, but it is like a really durable travel case. Um, they are too big to put on an airplane seat, unfortunately. I wish that would be so much cheaper. Um, but this would probably be conducive to bringing on a plane if I bought a seat like a cellist or, or a double in an electric basis. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I suspect that harps can have different numbers of strings on them. So how do you assign those numbers and are they, are all the harps basically the same in terms of the Right. Yeah, so the question was about the number of strings on a harp and are harps similar in terms of strings. So there's set sizes for harps, kind of like if you have a cello or a bass, you know, you have quarter size, half size, you know, that obviously doesn't change the number of strings on a bass or a violin per se. Um, but for example, this is a lever harp. I believe it has 30 something strings. I wish I knew exactly. Uh, but concert grand pedal harps all have 47 strings. Semi grand concert harps always have 46 strings. Um, when you get to folk and Celtic harps, it can vary just based on the size of the harp. So a beginner student harp might have, you know, 15 to 26 strings. Um, it depends on the instrument maker. There's a couple of big harp manufacturers. There's Lion and Healy, which is my favorite. They're based out of Chicago. All my harps are Lion and Healy. Um, and then there's Salvi, which is based out of Italy, and they also are a big manufacturer of harp. But when you get to folk harps, et cetera, there's just a myriad of uh, harp manufacturers. And then in the terms of how strings are, um, they always are in a diatonic scale, so it's always C, D, E, F, G, A, B, so it's like the white keys on a piano. Um, and if you look at the harp, there's different colored strings. 
So all of the strings that are the note C are red, and all the strings that are the note F are blue or black. So that's how you can know what string you're playing. If they were all the same color, it would be horrendously confusing. Um, but typically all the strings are colored the same, all of the notes are this, in the same order. Um, you can tune harps to different tunings. I actually have my harp tuned to the key of E flat um, major, so that when I have levers, I have more keys I can move into than if I had it uh, tuned to C natural. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you say Z, L, K? B, uh, B, B as in Brooke, L as in Laura, K as in Noel, <laughs> harp, uh, dot com. So it's my initials, B, L, K, harp, dot com. Yeah. Thank you again so much for having me come speak, and um, thank you again for reminding me.